the resurrected king is resurrecting me. We got to talk about that because it's Easter. Happy Easter. I knew you wanted to. I knew you wanted to. Happy Easter. It's so great to be with you today. First timers, millionth timers. We're so glad you're here today. Easter is such a great day for churches, Christians, all across the world who gather in places like these and we bring in all of our love for Jesus, all of our respect for Jesus. But not only that, we carry in huge questions about Jesus. And I want you to know that that's okay. Yes, even on Easter, nobody's expecting you and thankfully even me to have it all put together. Questions are okay. God can work with us, and you are right on time, right the right where you are as you are. Uh, one of the big questions that we can ask about Jesus is going to dominate our time together this morning, and the question is, what's the deal with the resurrection? Why is the resurrection relevant? And so I want to tell you, the resurrection is relevant and has meaning for all of us because it addresses all of our deepest fears and all of our greatest needs. Does God care about me, about my, about my family, and can God and I ever be on speaking terms considering the things that I've done and, and, and what happens after I die? And, and does my life matter? And is my life worth living? These are just a few of the questions that churn deep within. They drive us on some pretty desperate searches in life. The resurrection addresses all of these questions. And it does it with confidence. It does it with optimism. If you've been around, you've been tuning in online, or you've been here in this place, you you know we've been in kind of in a three-week stretch of taking the weekend that rattled the world one day at a time, Friday. Saturday, Sunday. So today marks sort of the finale of this great conversation that we've been having. I want to I want to jump back into an account of Jesus's life, and it's going to help us get back in gear. The Bible says that when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, they brought they bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus's body. And very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. So it's the first day of the week. It's Sunday. We've waited two weeks here to finally say, okay, now it's Sunday. But there are references to Friday and Saturday here. So this is a great place for us to kind of jump back in and catch up with each other. The reference you see here to Friday is this one, Jesus' body. You and I know enough to know that we call people by their first name. That's good enough. Only when they're deceased. That's when we start calling it the body. And the deal about Friday with Jesus is that Friday was the day that Jesus died. On the calendar, we we routinely, we refer to this as Good Friday. And I want to say welcome back to anybody, everybody who came on Good Friday two days ago here in this building, Heritage, we got to host the Round Lake Beach Good Friday experience. It was awesome. I'm so glad that you came. You might be here for the first time because you came on Friday. Thanks so much for trusting us with your time. It was an amazing event. There were so many volunteers that made it possible for us to, in an engaging way, make the story of Jesus accessible to people Towns away, people who have a church, don't have a church, never been to a church. It was awesome. I want you to know that people made first-time decisions to start following Jesus as of Friday because of the event that we got to host together. Isn't that amazing? I mean, today's the day that we celebrate new life. That always excites us. And then on top of that, you know that the the other part of the event was that we hosted a, we got to host a blood drive uh, uh, in the lower level. And uh, that was the first time for us The organizers of that event were blown away at how busy they were and how, you know, when they set up for a first time in the first place, they don't expect a lot of activity. They got in touch with me later and said, your people are awesome. They said, the amount of blood that was donated, mostly from you, we're going to be able to save almost 60 lives because of the blood that was donated. We praise God for that. That's not small. All of that was linked to us observing the events of Good Friday because Good Friday was the day Jesus was killed. It was a ghastly day, a day filled with mockery toward the pure, suffering for the innocent. 
It's loyalty destroying betrayal. Stomach turning injustice. It all and it all happened so so fast. And so these women, these women would have followed Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, some few men of stature who probably paid Pilate for the right to take his body off the cross and, and, and bury it with at least a little bit of dignity. They're going to put it in Joseph's family tomb these days. If, you, if you've got some money, maybe you buy a burial plot for the entire family one day. Back then, they would purchase a localist, which is kind of think of a concrete bunker. It's, it's carved out of rock, and this is where all your family members will be one day. And Joseph brings it there. The women would have followed to this borrowed tomb. They've never been there before. They would have watched as these men laid Jesus' body there. Kind of a rust job. And then they all, everybody just hustles home. That was Friday. The reference here to Saturday is this word Sabbath. If you lived in this day, you were a faithful person. Once a week, regularly, you uh, ceased from work from Friday sundown through Saturday to Saturday sundown. They called it Sabbath. And so, so imagine being one of these followers. They are forced to suddenly downshift from, from just dis- distressing, adrenaline, pumping activity to complete inactivity. And Saturday of the weekend that rattled the world was a time to go slow and try to wake up from the nightmare. And, and, and mostly, get this, mostly start second-guessing everything that they had been betting their lives on, some of them for, for years. I mean, if you know the story, you know that it felt like just one minute on what we call on the calendar Passover Sunday, or excuse me, um, uh, uh, Palm Sunday, uh, they're, they're all cheering wildly, Jesus comes into Jerusalem on a colt and it's all like according to prophecy and it feels like the whole town shows up and they all got their foam number one fingers, you know, Jesus is number one and every, everyone's going nuts and the disciples are like, finally, they get it and, and he's probably going to declare himself the Messiah and it's all finally happening and six days later, Jesus is publicly lynched. All the foam fingers are cast into the fireplaces. There was no hope anymore now because you can't have a Christianity if you don't have a Christ. That was Saturday. And this this hopelessness continues into early Sunday morning. What is this group of female troopers doing with spices? What are they doing going to the tomb? Well, they've waited through Saturday to go with these spices and these perfumes, and they're, they're basically going to pay respect and play mortician, AK, AKA they're going back to the tomb. They're going to continue their grief. They're going to try, to try to catch up emotionally and give the body of the best person they had ever known a little proper dead guy treatment. And listen, we're going to establish this. Not expecting anything else at all that's critical to the story i hope that stands out to you today and you carry it with you for years to come whether you would call yourself a a seasoned believer in christ or a rookie believer in christ or an ex-christian or somebody who says i'm just here with a collar on because it's easter and my family always does this and and we always kind of work this jesus story into the day somehow kind of like twas the night before christmas typically comes up in december or Elf, or Grinch, or whatever. Like, that's, that's I, I know the story. No matter what your experience is with the story, you got to know something. That as Jesus' closest followers approached the tomb, not a single one of them was expecting a resurrection. We're going to see this. Nobody was expecting, nobody went with a bullhorn expecting to get up on a rock and go, all right, here we go, guys. Ten, nine. Eight, cue the trumpets, seven. Like, that was not in anybody's head. Nobody writes this, their story in, going, yeah, I had a, I had a pretty good idea. I was the first one. I, I, I was on to it. The only thing on their minds, two things. Jesus is dead. We were wrong. And it would have been so great if this great, great teacher, like, actually knew what he was talking about. 
would have been so great if this miracle worker would have been the miracle God's people were waiting for, this Messiah that they'd waited for for centuries. But clearly they were wrong because God would never allow his, like actually allow his Messiah, a Messiah to be crucified. So they're on their way to the tomb. And the Bible says they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Remember, it's a borrowed family tomb. It's from a stranger. This is likely not a permanent situation. This whole weekend has been a IDK. We will figure it out as we go. And so they're prepared, and yet we're st- we still have some logistics to cover. And the Bible says, but when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had, had been rolled away. Okay, and you know what Luke records? It says they went on into the tomb and they saw that it was completely empty. And they all shouted, yippee ki right? They did not. They panicked. They started stressing. Nobody expected a resurrection. It's, uh, John records that they were telling the disciples, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put them or put, uh, put it. Do you have any clue who did this? Absolutely not. On Friday, it seemed like enemies of all kinds just came out of the woodwork. We have no clue who did this. Somebody took this body. It's the only explanation. Dead people stay dead. <laughs> and, and it's just kind of like my kids. If they lose a hoodie, it's, it's not I lost my hoodie. It's always someone took it. And so there, here they are. And they're like, Some, somebody took the body. There's no other way to explain it. We went in. We saw where the grave linen that, was, it, that he was laid on him on Friday. That's still there. It's actually folded up like really neatly, which makes no sense. Like Who checks out of a hotel and makes the bed before they go. Like that's part of the, why, we, why we get hotel rooms. So we can kind of live out our sloppy side. This is, just, this is just all strange. And it's getting stranger. And Luke says, Luke says the disciples heard the ladies report. And they shouted yippee ki No, not a chance. They were completely skeptical. Verse 11. The story sounded like nonsense to the men. And they didn't believe it. Mary... Mary, slow down. Slow down. We know how you are with directions. Like, this has got to be the wrong tomb. There's no, they're not, I'm, we're not even going to get excited about this. So Luke records that, the Gospels record Peter and John. Go ahead. Luke says that uh, Peter jumps up. He ran to the tomb to take a look. I always read that like, Peter's really excited. He knows what's happening. I'm almost thinking Peter's like, well, I have to check this out because they won't let it alone, but I'm still afraid uh, for my own life. So uh, ran along, you know. Uh, He runs to the tomb to take a look. Stooping, he peers in, and he saw the empty linen wrappings. And then he went home again. And Peter and John are scratching their heads. They're wondering what happened. Nothing is adding up here. Now, let's just pause Because maybe you should allow yourself to write yourself into the story here. Maybe you have something in common with Jesus' first century friends. That you come in here and maybe you would say, I've got no problem believing that Jesus was a historical figure. I've got no problem believing that he was a really good dude. Morally above par, worth imitating. But when it comes to a a resurrection, somebody who is dead that just comes to to life again, it just feels like a little bit of nonsense. If that's the way you feel, you are in excellent company. Jesus' closest friends felt the same way that you have felt. The very people that you would have thought would be running through the streets for hours by now going, in your face! <laughs> Nothing close to it. They are scared for whatever seems to be happening. And what we're reading here, and I really love this, is the record that they documented. Is that they didn't believe. They documented their own disbelief. And why that is important to me is because 
I get that way too. I have moments from time to time of skepticism, cynicism, feeling doubtful, feeling ashamed of the things that I don't feel like I can believe. And maybe you get that way too. And here's the encouragement for people like us. Never write your doubts out of your story. All it means is that God's not done yet. And the deal is, is that God is God, which means you are free to leave off at your doubt where God is going to pick up. He can work with you. He can work with us. He can handle it. If you will just stay open to him, he will do the rest of the heavy lifting. So in the story, uh, John records on the, on the evening of the first day that week. So now it's, it's Sunday evening. The disciples are together. The doors are locked. For fear of the Jewish leaders, there is no party. They're confused. They are paranoid. And they're like, oh, man, they're not done. None of this craziness is over. Can I please get off the train? They got permission to take care of Jesus. We are clear it's going to be open season on all of his followers now. And so now they are hiding out like they have the last two nights. And guess what happens? John says, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. But the whole group was startled and frightened. Just nod your head if you're like, yeah, I get that. <laughs> yeah, I could believe that. Startled and frightened, they were thinking that they were seeing a ghost. And why are you frightened? He asked, why are, you, why are your hearts filled with doubt? And if you want a picture here, I think you can picture Jesus just standing there, just kind of casual, and grinning with the biggest grin on his face why because jesus messed with his disciples like this all the time like it's it's recorded that whenever something was happening that would cause the the disciples to be truly afraid he had this way of like smiling at them and say what <laughs> why why are you why are you afraid like let's talk about let's talk about spiders in your house. There's if there, you have a house set with two adults, usually you don't have two people who don't care about spiders, two people who are both afraid of spiders. There's one person who is afraid of spiders and they're getting an elbow right now, probably, right? When there's a spider in your house, you've got one person grinning, maybe even holding it and saying, What? It's just a spider. Why are you so afraid? And then typically the other adult is backing away, like on all fours. Throwing lamps in general direction of spider, and, they're, and they're, they, they can't handle it. And see, this is the thing. Jesus had this way of, of leading with confidence when his disciples were the most upset and the most afraid. I feel like this is just another one of those moments where in a, a, a locked room, deadbolt on, chair up against the doorknob, and then suddenly the room count goes up by one. Bing! <laughs> And they're huddled together. So maybe we're touching shoulders with Jesus. Like, that's creepy. Jesus, why? And he, and he just appears among them. And they're startled. And they're backed away. And they say, are you seeing what I'm saying? That looks like Jesus. And in an obvious freak out moment, Jesus says, why are you guys freaking out? And they go, okay, that sounds like something Jesus would say. And Jesus is right there with them. And he looks them in the eye. And he, and he starts to, Luke tells us in chapter 24, he starts to give them some context. He says, guys, don't, don't you remember what I told you when I was still with you? And the answer is no, because they always had this way of checking out when Jesus would give them bad news about himself. They kind of assumed, oh, he's exaggerating or he's making a, a point. But this is Jesus, Jesus is the best person we've ever known. Bad things do not happen to good people. And Jesus says, I told you, everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And this way of talking was the way they described their Bible, their sacred scriptures. They had sacred scriptures that made it into our Bible. And Jesus says, I told you, it was foretold in the sacred scriptures. Remember when I said that the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day? And repentance, and listen, for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, starting where? In Jerusalem, right where they are right now. It's like he called it. 
And then he says something that changes their lives for the rest of their lives and changes your life and my life. Because Christians are not gathering today around the world as they have for the last 20 centuries. If Jesus does not say what he says next, he says, And you, gentlemen, you are witnesses of these things. And they were. They were witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. It was the main event of the weekend that rattled the world. Before the resurrection, there's no Christianity. Because there's no Christianity without a Christ. There's no movement to keep moving if you don't have a body that is still moving. There was nobody on Friday night and Saturday that were looking to keep things going and write Jesus songs or, you know, keep the parable of the Good Samaritan and the prodigal son in circulation. Why? Because everything Jesus said and did, as spectacular as it was, it was all hooked into the amazing claims of himself that he made. And clearly he couldn't be any of those things anymore because he's dead After the resurrection, it all changes. It's game on again. And they were witnesses. This is a great thing to understand. That the reason that we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, it's because of their testimony. It's it's not so much that the Bible tells me so. It's because eyewitnesses tell us so. We believe because Matthew was an eyewitness and he told his story. He documented his experience with Jesus. We believe because Mark got really close to Peter. He was a follower and he, and he wrote down all of Peter's account. We believe because Luke came along a little later and thoroughly investigated these events. He talked to as many eyewitnesses as possible He starts his whole account describing it that way. We believe because John, who was an eyewitness, he was there at the cross. He was there in the tomb. He was there in the room. He put together his own account of Jesus' death and resurrection. We believe because Peter saw Jesus raised from the dead. And later, he wrote letters to the churches to say so as much. We believe because James... The brother of Jesus. He shows up late in the story. He declares. Now, I want you to imagine this. If you've got brothers, I've got four. Jesus sees the resurrected Lord and declares Jesus Lord. What would it take for your brother to be declared Lord by you? Like, you know all the things. It's like more than a few card tricks, right? Like more... More than a few fancy miracles. But James met his resurrected brother and declared his brother his Lord. And then last, and he would say the least, the apostle Paul believed that Jesus rose from the dead. He saw the resurrected Lord. Now this is a guy who had first set out to extinguish any trace of this stupid, stupid rumor going around. That Jesus the Nazarene, Jesus the Galilean, this guy, was God. He set his fangs upon his task. Eventually he was converted. He gave his life to Christ and to sharing Christ with other people, everyone he could meet. These were eyewitnesses. And there were more. These eyewitnesses documented these events, told their story. Their testimonies were gathered. They were written down, they were copied, they were distributed, and that's why you and I are here today. It's why we say that the foundation of the Christian faith, it's an event. It's not so much that we have a resurrection on our hands because we have a Bible. It's the other way around. We actually have a Bible because we have a resurrection. And so the foundation of the Christian faith, it's not faith. It's not fairy tale. It's not a book The resurrection is an extraordinary event with profound implications for your life, your fears, your hopes, your dreams. It is the event of the weekend that rattled the world. And I want to give us kind of a snapshot on how. 
I want to show from Peter's own testimony how it changed his life to give us an idea of how it is changing lives in this room and all over the globe and how it might change your life. This guy Peter, who wrote down this little paragraph I want to show you, this guy Peter, who was so critical to the story, Peter, who saw it all, this is what he dedicated, it's in 1 Peter chapter 1, and he says, praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just pause, look at me. Peter believed, Peter believed that God was Jesus' father. And he says, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth, new life, into a living hope. And, and know about this word hope. It's not a verb. It's, it's a noun. It's, a, it's not Peter saying this is kind of like wish upon a star kind of hope. He's saying, because of what Jesus has done, we can live in ever-renewing hope. We can live in confident expectation, which is a pretty bold claim. And so you and I in our right minds would say, well, Peter, how can you make such a guarantee? Like, what tangible evidence do you have? Like, why can you, as an old man now, up in your years, Write this down and risk your life and flirt with death every day. Where do you get this extraordinary confidence? And he says, through the resurrection of the dead. If you were to ask Peter, what is the foundation of your faith? He would not tell you. Because Jesus had great ideas about love. Because I love this parable that he told once and I could totally relate. He would say, my faith in Jesus was resurrected when I, when I saw my resurrected friend with, with my own eyes. He goes on to say, he uses this interesting word next, this word inheritance. This new life that you and I are promised it comes with an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, fade. That's an important word. Why? Because who gets an inheritance? The kids in the family get the inheritance. And the, and the Apostle Peter reminds us here that there's a relational outcome to all of this. That's a big change for a person. Is that Jesus has paved a way for us to have a relationship with God that can be described as a Kind of a relationship between a perfect father and his son. A perfect father and his daughter. And then he goes on to say this inheritance is guarded. It's, it's kept in heaven for you. This is also huge. Peter believed in heaven. And it's not because Peter grew up even as a kid hearing about heaven. It was highly unlikely that, that Peter had been told anything about heaven because because the Jewish scriptures said virtually nothing about heaven at all. In fact, there's so little in the Jewish uh, scriptures about heaven that even the Jewish leaders were completely divided. Half of them didn't believe there was a heaven at all. It was a hot debate of the day. So Peter did not believe in heaven because of something that he was taught as a child. Peter believed in heaven because of something that he saw as an adult, a resurrected Jesus who spoke often about heaven. He goes on to say, hey, in all this you greatly rejoice, re rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Let me show you another major shift. The pain and the suffering in the world was never a deterrent for Peter to believe in God's love. Or God's existence. Although that's really a common reason why people don't believe in God. And I'll tell you why. For Peter, it's because he saw Jesus suffer. And he saw Jesus die. And then later, if you keep reading, he had coffee and breakfast with Jesus on the beach. He, he saw the end of evil. That evil did all it could do. And there was still more to the story. Peter's faith was not tethered in this imaginary God who doesn't allow bad things to happen to good people. That wasn't his God. 
But the resurrection had convinced Peter that God might allow evil. He doesn't allow evil to have the final say. And if you've lost faith in God because of some evil, and I mean some evil that you've experienced, I want to invite you to reconsider. Because men and women who bring us the story of Jesus experienced a level of pain and suffering that you and I cannot even imagine, including watching the worst imaginable things happen to the best person that they had ever known. Glory Sunday was never a reason for them to forget Gory Friday. In fact, if you skip ahead in Peter's letter, he says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty life, the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. See, we were bought into heaven with Jesus' shed blood. And Peter's saying, look, look what, look what came of this. God sent an eternal thing to make you an eternal thing. But we had to have Friday's bloodbath to get there. And he invokes this, this picture of atonement that was so familiar of his audience in the day. Where the lifeblood of animals regularly stood in the place of sinners in order to reconcile them to God. A life for a life. And Peter's now in his, his older years, he's looking back on the crucifixion. He's looking back on the resurrection. And he's saying, now we get it. God sent a perfect lamb to cover us once and for all. And that opened up the path for us to just go to God. To just go to God like our dad, just like Jesus invited us to. It all worked out in the end. Can you see the profound implications in this single event for Peter's life? For our lives, it wasn't necessarily the teachings or the miracles of Jesus. It was the resurrection of Jesus that completely reframed all of their lives. Men and women who were stunned as we would have been and yet emerged with extraordinary faith in God. It was all because of the resurrection. And the invitation of the resurrection is to allow Jesus to reframe your life as well. We've been talking about the weekend, and as we know about every weekend, every weekend ends. And at the tail end of every weekend, usually Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, our thoughts start looking ahead to Monday. Sometimes reluctantly so. Totally get that. But our thoughts start moving to a whole new run that is in store for us. And when it comes to the weekend that rattled the world, listen, the resurrection is an extraordinary event with profound implications for your life and my life. This could start a whole new run for you. So let's just kind of recap. And I want to give a picture of what could change in your life that otherwise would probably just stay stuck. Change number one, you can know that God is personal. It's because Jesus is alive. Peter knew with certainty that there is a valid invitation on the table for all of us to start going to God like a perfect dad. You can start counting on him to really actually come through for you. You can count on him to be the strong one. The, the, the wise one, in, in times when he comes off harsh, it's because he knows better and you will thank him later. And in other times where his tenderness just is so apparent, there will be no other place in the world that you would rather be than in his presence, than in his arms. You can know that God is personal. Change number two, you can know that heaven is is real. And it's not a hope so thing because you were told that as a kid or because you went to a, a funeral and it was scary and you thought the pastor's job was to make sad people happy. You can know that heaven is real because Jesus taught there is a heaven. 
And he said, he has saved a spot for every one of his followers. And he explained that not only does he know the way to heaven, but he is the way to heaven. And then he went and conquered death to show that nobody's going to stand in his way. Not for him and not what he wants to do for you. Change number three. You can know that suffering is not evidence of God's absence. Why? Because men and women who witnessed and experienced extraordinary suffering maintained their faith anyway. I mean, imagine what could happen and change for you when what you believe is not based on fantasy or, uh, you know, this idea of a perfect life attainable on planet Earth, this idea where bad things actually don't happen to good people, but instead... When the foundation of what you believe is a resurrected Savior who eventually overcomes all evil with good, overcomes all darkness with light in his own perfect timing. And change number four, you can know that the life, that life for Jesus means life for you. His glorious, resurrected, powerful, unbeatable life becomes his gift to you. He, 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 when you believe in him, he puts his life in you. Heaven is now where you belong, but he puts his life in you pre-heaven. <laughs> he puts it in you early. You become a forever family member now. Starting on the inside, you are changed and you become ever-changing. And, and just as you don't deserve to be loved and forgiven the way God has loved and forgiven you, you get this new life that is freed up from all the baggage that you carried into this moment, carried into this relationship. You get freed from that so you get to start loving and forgiving other people the way God has loved and forgiven you. Loving and forgiving other people who also don't deserve to be loved and forgiven. And in living this kind of life, you start bringing heaven to earth. You you start living a different life around just everyone around you. It's an amazing new way of living that becomes mounting proof that you've entered a kingdom that is not of this world. It's the upside down kingdom of God that would ultimately circle the globe and impact every civilization on earth for almost 2,000 years. It's a kingdom where the king chose to give his life for his subjects. What do we do with this? I just want to close this by giving you a challenge and, and making an invitation. For every one of us here. For every one of us here who walked in saying, I recognize Jesus Christ as that king. He's king over all. He's king in my life. This is compelling stuff. My challenge would be, do the people in your life, by watching you live, know that you're part of this kingdom? By how you talk, how you react, how you decide... Is it clear to them that you bow the knee to somebody greater? That you belong to something else and the pressure is off and it's on him and it's his company and it's not yours? And if it's not clear to them by watching you live, let me ask you, what's the holdup? Just get one. The first obvious major one. If we walk out of here focused on that, we're already making progress because there's a resurrected life in you. You don't have to say no to that. You can continue to change from the inside out because Christ the King has given you his life. And here's the invitation, and the invitation is really for the rest of us. If you have never viewed Jesus Christ this way, would you accept him as your king? He has done all the heavy lifting. You can accept him right now. Let me pray for you. Take a posture where you just bow your head and close your eyes and feel like you are alone before God. I'll walk you through the kind of words that many people in this room have used, including me. You would say, Christ, there is no doubt if you can bring yourself back to life from the dead. You are king, and I am not. 
And I am what the Bible describes as a sinner. I've never been perfect like you. And I'm really tired of hiding that and faking that. I am ready to admit that as a sinner, I have baggage that would separate me from my perfect creator. You have said, I don't have to be his enemy. I can be brought into the family as a son, as a daughter, and we can be friends and start a relationship, and I do not have to worry anymore because I'm asking for forgiveness, and Jesus' death has paid for all that I need forgiveness for. I accept the free gift of eternal life right now that has been offered to me by faith through the death and the, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want to be on your team, following your lead in your family, and change from the inside out for the rest of my days. And it's in your name I pray these things. Amen.